Well, good morning and welcome again to another lecture uh, for the pre-calculus course. Um, this morning we're going to be talking about three sections, section 1.8 on inequalities, 1.9 and 1.10. We're skipping over sections 1.6 on complex numbers and 1.7 on modeling, um, and we're moving right into 1.8 on inequalities. So with, without, uh, without sp saying too much here at the beginning, we'll just jump right in. Um, so inequalities, they're very, very similar to equalities, right? The only difference is this sign is replaced with one of these signs. So we've got less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. Um, and as you can tell, there's um, some similarities here, right? This top sign here means equals. And these two include that as well. So we've got the strict inequalities here, the strict ones. And now that just looks like a bad emoji. But we've got the strict ones, and we've got the non-strict ones um, that allow for equality. The strict e inequalities do not allow for equalities. Now when you're solving an inequality, what you're doing is very similar to what you did for equalities. You're using basic operations to create equivalent inequalities. That is, you're, you're using basic operations to change what you see in order to find, uh, find numbers or solutions which satisfy some different equation, but which also will then solve the original equation or the inequality. Um, so a, a really nice quick example is this equation. And we'll look at this similar inequality. So in the top equation, we've got 4x plus 7 is 19. And if we try to solve this, we'll you know subtract 7 from both sides to get the equivalent expression 4x equals 12, which if we divide both sides by 3 by 4 gives us x equal to 3. This is the only solution. There's one number which when you plug in for x makes this equality true. There's only one number which makes this true. For inequalities, we're going to use very much the same process where we're adding and subtracting things across. So 4x plus 7 being less than or equal to 19 means that 4x must be less than or equal to 12. We're just subtracting 7. And if we divide both sides by 4, we get that the number x must be less than or equal to 3. See, there's a slight difference here well, from the first one. What we're saying here is that any number equal to or less than 3 is a solution for this inequality. In other words, we could plug in 0, and we get a true statement. 4 times 0 plus 7 is 7. That is definitely less than or equal to 19. We could plug in another number, a negative number, negative 10 for example. 4 times negative 10 plus 7 is negative 33. That's still less than or equal to 19. So when we've solved an inequality, we've, we've found actually a big set of numbers, usually a big set, sometimes empty, but we've found a set, we've found a set of numbers that solves the inequality. It's similar to equalities, but usually equalities have you know some short list in our in our course. Inequalities, on the other hand, give entire intervals or entire you know massive subsets of the real line that solve uh, the original inequality. So what we've found here is if we look at the real line, we've got this number x equals three here. And we found that any number smaller than or equal to 3 solves our inequality. All of them solve it. It's not just a list of 1 or 2 or 3. That's quite different, I think, than the equalities we've worked with before. So there's a basic set of rules that we can use to solve inequalities. And you saw a couple of them uh, demonstrated there. 
the first rule is if we've got some inequality like this, something is less than or equal to something else. Well, that's equivalent to this. We take something else, some anything, right? We add it to both sides. Oops, plus. We just add a number or we add an expression, an entire expression to both sides. The inequality is still the same. Whatever is going to make this inequality true will make this inequality true. Okay, so if you can solve this, you've solved this. You saw that in the last one where I added and subtracted seven to both sides. The second basic rule is if you've got an inequality, a less than or equal to b, this is equivalent to subtracting. Which is exactly what I did in the previous example. Okay, and, and these are the same thing here, right? So c could actually be a negative number here, in which case we're subtracting. And uh, c could actually be a negative number here, in which case we're adding. But we'll keep these two separate. Uh, and now I'm gonna introduce this symbol. If I use this double arrow, like this, that means is equivalent to, right here, is equivalent to, it's just shorthand. Okay, so the next property is if we've got a positive number, so let's take any positive number, this is C, okay, it's not zero and it's not negative, then what we can say is, um, the inequality A less than or equal to B is equivalent to the product of C times both sides. C times A is less than or equal to C times B. Okay, so if I can solve this, then I've solved this. Any number which makes the right side true makes the left side true. Okay. Uh, you, you saw me do this in the previous example where I divided both sides by four. Uh, I really multiplied by one fourth, right? Okay. The next one is a little trickier, but I think I'll, I'll give you a quick a quick example, um, just to make it solid in your minds. If c is less than zero, so now what if we have a negative number? Well, then a less than or equal to b is equivalent to, and maybe you remember this from a high school course where you had to remember this over and over and over again. C times A is greater than or equal to C times B. Right? The old phrase is, I think, if it's negative, you've got to flip the direction. So the alligator mouth, I guess that's this thing, you've got to flip the direction if you're multiplying by a negative number. And a really quick example of this is just to, just to give you some real numbers here to work with. You know, we'll take something that's true. 10 is less than or equal to neg uh, uh, not negative, 100. Right, this is true. And let's multiply both sides by just a simple number, negative 1. So what do we get? We get negative 1 times 10, negative 10. And 100 is negative 100. And which one of these is smaller? Right, it's the negative 100. Right, so this is true and this is true. If we forget to switch that negative sign around or that inequality sign around, we get something that is not true. Right? Negative 10 is not smaller than negative 100. Okay. Um, the next property that we'll deal with here is, is this. If Um, if we've got two positive numbers, so if A and B are positive, they're not zero and they're not negative, then if A is less than or equal to B, then we certainly have 1 over B is less than or equal to 1 over A. Right? You can turn this into a comparison of fractions. 
that's only true if both A and B are positive. It does not work if one of them or both of them perhaps are negative. Okay, and number six. <clears throat> if we've got some comparisons like this, in fact, we're gonna make things a bit more complicated here. Let's say we've got a bunch of numbers. A is less than or equal to B, and we've actually got two more numbers with some comparison. C is less than or equal to D. Okay, so we've got just this sort of thing happening. Two comparisons that we know are true. Then we can say this. The sum of the smaller two is less than or equal to the sum of the bigger two. Okay, so we take this smaller one and this smaller one, we add them together. We take this bigger one and this bigger one, we add them together. And I, Now that I've said it in words, I think it should be obvious. If we add the two smaller things and we add the two bigger things, we certainly have that the smaller, the smaller sum is bigger or smaller than the bigger sum, right? In words, it seems kind of trivial, but this is kind of a formalism that we're making here. All right. Okay, and the next one is is kind of a an algebraic thing here, um, or maybe a logical thing here. It's that inequalities are transitive. Okay, so if you have that a is less than or equal to b, and so if a is less than or equal to b, and b is less than or equal to c, then we certainly have that a is less than or equal to c. All right, because we can create this big chain, a less than or equal to b, less than or equal to c, we certainly have the final result that A is less than or equal to C. Inequalities are transitive. Okay, now notice that I did all of these rules or I did all these properties uh, with a less than or equal to sign. Right, so the whole time I was using this sign. But all of these rules still hold if you use the greater than or equal to sign and they or, or this less than sign or the greater than sign they, they, they all still hold it doesn't matter which one you're you're dealing with okay and so there's some you know there's there's a lot of utility in these seven rules um, because you can use them all for any one of these four right okay so um, the next thing we're going to look at is just solving a quick one of these, all right? Just solving a linear inequality. So this would be a nice ex little example for us before we move on to some more theory. So let's suppose we have 3x is less than 9x plus 4. Well, to solve this, you, you, you can essentially treat it like it's an equality, right? But the rules are slightly modified. Um, and then you can use these modified rules and work through it, right? And so the, the basic idea with equalities was to get all the variables on one side and all the constants on the other if you can. We call that isolating variable. So uh, I'm going to subtract 9x from both sides. That's just a number. 9 times x, right? And what rule are we following here? Well, it depends. If x is negative or if x is positive, it depends which rule we're using here but essentially it's either rule or one or two from before. Um, so we've got negative six x is less than four, positive four, okay? <clears throat> now what I wanna do is I wanna eliminate the coefficients on the x. So I'm gonna divide by negative six. Now rule number Four says if we've got a negative number and we divide it across an inequality, we need to flip the direction of the inequality. So x is the only thing that's left on the left side because we've divided by that coefficient, it cancels it out. On the right side, we've got 4 over negative 6, which is negative 2 thirds. The inequality just flips directions. 
So what we found here is that any number bigger than negative two-thirds solves this inequality. So we could pick zero or one or two or three or any number bigger than negative two-thirds. If we were to plug it into our original equation, or sorry, inequality, it would solve it. It would be a true statement. So this is one way of writing your solution, right? X must be bigger than negative two-thirds. Another way is to graph it on a number line. So you would find negative two-thirds uh, which is, you know, right about there more or less. And then because we've got a strict inequality here, we, ca we can't actually use negative two-thirds, right? So we're going to use just a an open circle there to say, hey, this is our boundary. And then, because anything bigger works, we're going to shade above this open circle. So any number that is shaded or has a, or is, is sorry, it's just shaded, works. We can't pick the circled number, that's the boundary. Um, in interval notation, we would have something like this negative two-thirds to infinity. Okay, in set builder notation, we would have this, all x, the set of all x such that x is bigger than negative two-thirds. So three, three uh, forms for your solution. Now you could do the set of all reals minus uh, this interval, negative infinity to negative two-thirds. That's also a, a way to write it, but uh, sort of not something we're looking at here. All right, so that's that for s just the rules, the basic rules of solving. Um, but now let's look at nonlinear inequalities, nonlinear things, like a quadratic or something like that. Um, the basic method for solving things like this is to look at uh, factoring factoring one side as well as you can and then asking yourself uh, about products of factors and uh, if the product is a positive product or a negative product. So let me give you a really quick example. Um, so x squared less than or equal to 5x minus 6. So if I want to solve this, it's not as simple as a linear one. Um, the, my goal, my basic goal is going to be to try and take everything to one side. So let's just go to the right side, uh, or to the left side I, I'll do. Uh, x squared minus 5x plus 6. If I've taken everything to the left side, there's nothing left on the right, so we've got a 0 there. Um, this left side I can factor x minus 3 x minus 2 and we know the product of these two things is 0 or less than or equal to 0 right so that less than or equals to says that so now when you've got these nonlinear things really what you're trying to find is properties of these products of factors so there's two basic properties that I want to illustrate with this. If you have an even number of positive or so sorry negative factors then the product is positive. Okay? So so take a look at what we've got up top here. We've got two factors. If both of these factors are negative, so like say I plug in zero, you get negative three times negative two. That is an even number of negative factors multiplied together, which gives us a positive number. 
okay? An even number of negative factors makes us makes a product positive. Okay, if you have an odd number of factors, the product is negative. Right? And in this problem, that's actually um, what we're going to try and use. We've got two factors. Are there numbers which we can sort of work at here or look for where only one of those two factors is negative? And the answer is definitely yes. And the way you can find these things is to look for their zeros. So th there was a reason I put this uh, less than or equal to zero, right? It's because I want to use the zero product property. When is the first product negative uh, zero? It's when x is three. So I'm going to list that out. The other one is two. When x is two, that is zero. Okay. Now once I've found these, what these two numbers do for us is they give us intervals. Negative infinity to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to infinity. Okay, they give us these three intervals. So the next thing I'm going to do is just sort of list my factors x minus 3 and x minus 2. I'm going to make this nice table because these zeros are the key to figuring out if we have an even or an odd number of negative factors. Right? Our overall goal is to find where this product is negative. Right? It is negative. So we need to find out where just one of these is negative and where the other one is positive. So we found the zeros, we found our intervals. Notice how the zeros form these like divisions between the intervals. So here we go, let's fill this out. If we have an x that is smaller than 2, smaller than 2, well when we subtract 3 we're definitely going to get a negative number. When we subtract 2 we'll still get a negative number because we're working with something smaller than 2. So this interval no matter what number we pick in here, will always give us a product of two negatives. So the product, which I'll make in a separate row here, it's an even number of negative factors multiplied together, which is positive, which is actually not what we're looking for in this problem. Okay, how about here? A number between two and three. So it's bigger than two, but smaller than three. Well, if we subtract three from a number smaller than three, we're going to get a negative result. If we subtract two from a number bigger than two, we get a positive result. So we have an odd number of factors here. One negative, one positive. We have an odd number of factors that are negative multiplied together giving us a negative result. So any number in here is going to do this. So this we see is one of the intervals which is a solution to the original problem that we had. I know this last one's not going to work out. Maybe you do as well, but let's just work through it. So if we pick a number bigger than 3, that's what this means, a number bigger than 3. If we subtract 3, we're going to have a positive number. If we have a number bigger than 3 and subtract 2, we're still going to have a positive number because it's bigger than 3. This was not a rule that I discussed, the product of two positives, right? But I hope you just remember that the product of any number of positive things is always positive. So to answer our question, what is the solution to the inequality x squared less than or equal to 5x uh, minus 6? Um, we've got this interval, right? two to three, which causes the equivalent inequality, x squared minus five x plus six, to be less than or equal to zero. This causes this to be true. 
But we also need to remember that two and three were zeros. So two and three make this equals. So we found the interval that gives us negatives, and we know that the end points of that interval give us the zeros. And since those are also allowed in this inequality, we have that two to three is the solution set. It's the solution to this. But because we used the, the rules correctly, it also solves the original problem. So this is our solution. The interval from two to three, including two and three. That's kind of a long process, but just to recap what we do is, when you're given a nonlinear problem like this with inequalities, the typical thing to do is to try and get everything to one side and factor the living daylights out of it, right? Just factor it as much as you can. And then ask yourself the question of, you know, how many negative products and how many, uh, how many negative factors do I have given a specific interval? Uh, and we found those intervals by, after factoring, finding the zeros. This table is a nice way of organizing which factors are positive and negative in specific intervals. Uh, and I would recommend doing something like this for problems if you, if you need to. Um, but then the end result is, is really in this final product line, right? So we factor, we find zeros, and then we are testing intervals. Okay. These problems do get kind of long and drawn out. So that's, that's going to be, we'll have more examples of that in class on Wednesday. Um, but then there's one other thing that we need to talk about here, the theory of a little bit, is um, uh, multiple inequalities. You saw this in the rules, right? If A is less than or equal to B, and if C is less than or equal to D, right? We've got these multiple inequality things. Um, uh, this can happen, right, at all sorts of times. So like, like this, what if 2x is less than or equal to 6, and, and 3x is greater than 1? Um, when you use a logical and, that means that both this and this must be true. They both must be true. If I said this, 2x less than or equal to 6, or 3x greater than 1, it's different. It means that either this one or this one, just one of them, needs to be true. Um, both could be true. There's a different exclusive or, where only one can be true, not both of them. Um, but in this text, I don't think that they use exclusive ors. You can solve things like this, just like we did before. It, and it's really no different. The goal is you're going to solve them both individually. And then you're going to look at the intersection of results. So let me erase this or, and we'll just solve. The left one is x is less than or equal to 3. The right one is x is greater than 1 third. <laughs> one third. If I were to graph these, it would, it would look something like this. Here's 3. Uh, here's 1 third. The inequality on the left here is x is less than 3. So I'll graph that in purple. We can have 3, so I use a closed dot. And then less than that. The other inequality on the right, I'll graph in blue. x is greater than 1 third. Open circle, because we cannot have 1 third. And then shading on the right. Okay, where do they overlap? What is the intersection? It's right here. We've got our interval where both these things are true. If we pick a number in this little interval between 1 third and 3, including 3, then it will be a solution to both of these inequalities. So that's how you deal with multiple inequalities you're looking for either unions or intersections. If the word and is used, you're looking at the intersection. 
You're looking for that intersection because in intersections, both things are true. If you had the word or, you would be looking at the union. The union, which would be entirely different because either x is less than 3, which is 3 or any negative number right below it, any low number lesser, or 1 third up to positive infinity. So you could literally take any number and it would, it would satisfy one of these two. Okay, So it's a little bit different. So this is a, a union of the two solution sets is what we're working with there. Okay. Now there's a special kind of problem where these things pop up over and over and over again and they are absolute values. So let me just run through absolute values and their properties with inequalities. So this is properties of absolute value inequalities. Okay, and there's four of them properties of absolute value inequalities. The first one is, if you have an absolute value like this, the absolute value of something is less than c, then this is equivalent to a double inequality. Okay, and I can write it two ways for you. It's this, negative c is less than x is less than c. In the previous way that I've written them, that's this, negative c is less than x and x is less than c. So both these things must be true. Second one is this. Uh, x is in red here. x is, the absolute value of x is less than or equal to c. That is the same as what I'm going to do up here. So for number two, I'm modifying number one. I'm just adding possibi the possibility of equality here on each of these. So rule one is strict inequality. Rule two is the possibility of equality in your inequality statement. Okay. So an absolute value problem really is a double inequality problem. And you should be able to translate from this to this with ease. Okay, number three is if you've got the absolute value of x is greater than c, you still have a double inequality, but instead of an and statement, you're going to have an or statement. You're going to have a, an or. So this is equivalent to x is greater than c or x is less than negative c. Okay. Remember that absolute values eliminate negative signs. So this one on the right basically says if x is bigger than c except that it's negative, right? The answer is like negative 100 compared to 10. Right? If you if you made this positive, 100 is clearly bigger than 10 issue is that it's negative. If we take the absolute value of that negative, it becomes obviously the positive and then it's thus bigger than 10. So that's what this is saying. If you've got the absolute value of a number x or variable x is bigger than something, then that means either x is just plain out, you know, it's just outright bigger than that something, or it's smaller than the negative of that something. Okay, and so only one of these needs to be true. Right? For for inequalities like this, where there's two combined with an or, only one of these two needs to be true in the solution set. Uh, number four is the same thing, but with inequality signs, with equality possibilities. Okay. So that's it for the theory. Um, today we look, just looked at a bunch of linear and nonlinear inequalities, and then we looked at some multiple inequalities, and uh, we went into the absolute value 
uh, inequality properties, uh, which you still see on the screen here. Um, next time we'll be looking at section 1.9, which is on uh, coordinate plane and graphs of equations. So we'll be looking at uh, what these things look like in a two-dimensional space. Okay. Uh, so thank you for stopping by. Thank you for watching. And I hope to see you next time. Until then.